Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President CEO of the Sandstone Group. Today is Saturday, the 24th, February 24th already. We had a crazy wild week in the news, and I mean, it is crazy. There are some things going on, though. I got to give a shout out to uh, Andrew Korbachu, and he had put out on his sub stack CNN's attempt to smear India for purchasing oil. Russian oil fell flat. In the words of Irina Slav, sanctions don't always work as intended. This was a pretty good article. It's on energynewsbeat.co. Have a great day. Have a great Saturday. Hug your family, hug your dog, and pass the word along. Thanks, and Michael and I will see you next week. All right, hey, let's get rolling around the country here. Uh, Excuse me, the world. Even the world's biggest electric vehicle market is slowing. Uh, boy, Michael, you take a look at that big picture. Uh, that's a lot of EVs mm-hmm. on racks, man. That looks like uh, Hot Wheels just all lined up. Uh, the explosion growth, Michael, is just nuts on what they were trying to do to the rest of the world as they were just building the cheap EV cars. And now they're uh, just proliferating around the world and they're piling up everywhere. Mm-hmm. This is an interesting point. Uh, BYD, the crown jewel of the Chinese car makers, is backed by Warren Buffett. Interesting. He added enough factory capacity alone by December to churn out 4 million cars a year. But California can't put any uh, charging stations in, so I find this quite humorous. Um, That figure is a million more than it sold in 2023. That is nuts. That goes along with our next story coming around the corner. It's foreign uh, factory making EVs, delivering cars from Uzbekistan, and a second in Thailand starts in July. Brazil and Hungary in the coming years are setting up a plant in Mexico, which you would consider exporting mm-hmm. to the U.S., that sells for eleven thousand dollars in china is that a scooter is that you know i don't know man is that holy smokes well i i think the the first thing that that's interesting is that there's a you know there's a math you know there was this boom of buying electric vehicles around the world i mean there's a reason guys like warren buffett got in on it you know the last i would say outside of 2023 2018 to 2022 there was quote unquote, this explosive growth in EVs. But now that growth has slowed. And as Stu mentioned, you're you're cr- tr- cranking out 4 million cars a year when you're only selling 3 million. That's where it's going to get you, you know, uh, Miss Producer, if you can throw up this, the, the, the head image, I and mean, that's where you get the Hot Wheels. You know, I mean, these <laughs> things, you just pick them out right there and just start running them down the tracks. Point is, this is now going to only make EVs cheaper. And if they plan on moving and trying to take market share in the United States, it'll be interesting to see if that happens. Cause I'm not convinced. I mean, I'm with you. I wouldn't want to get in an $11,000 car. That's really a scooter. I mean, it's like every European yep. movie you see when the bad guy's running by and he slams into one of those like smart cars. That's all I can think about is now I'm just, oh, no. I'm going to end up on, uh, get my car stolen as an extra in an action movie. Um, um, but what this will do is this will only make it cheaper. And I wonder what this will do to Tesla's dominance in the United States. You know, another interesting point of this article is they point out that Tesla is not the major EV provider worldwide. They're only the major EV provider in the United States. And what happens when these these cars will inevitably make themselves make it into America? It's just going to happen like Hyundai, like Toyota. It eventually things just migrate into the United States uh, from overseas in terms of top brands. So it'll be interesting to see how consumers differentiate. I mean, I, I the oh, yeah. thing that Tesla has going for it is the autopilot and the self-driving. And you could argue that that is the reason Tesla is more valuable than the fact that it's an EV. It's that they well, have this completely... Yeah theoretically revolutionary technology that could allow us to basically all stop driving, which would be sweet. 
I'll tell you, I, I don't know enough about this one yet, but Michael, the insurance around the world for EVs is doubling and tripling. And so I, I think you're going to see a slowdown in EV purchases because of insurance. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite honestly, when you have an EV break, uh, all you have to do is crack one small uh, battery panel and, mm -hmm. the, and the EVs totaled. Yep. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, oh, no, I don't know if I want to own. I'm not owning an EV. I think and, and I think what this article points out specifically is that there's a there's kind of an inflection point coming with EVs where mm -hmm. supply is outpacing demand. And that as an economist, that always leads to a massive price drop. So maybe this will allow more people who want an EV to get it. The question is, where do those price cuts come into is it tesla oh, yeah. its prices or is it china and this byd pushing really hard to get its cars into the united states because they have the price advantage government approves construction permit for new type of nuclear reactor first time in decades this is huge Love uh, this. the u.s nuclear regulatory commission has issued a construction permit for a new type of nuclear test reactor in oak ridge tennessee molten fluoride salt instead of wa water as a coolant. This is really huge. Uh, Kairos Power is uh, thrilled to have uh, its archived its major regulatory milestone as fi final preparations to start construction at the Hermes site next year, said Mark LaFleur, uh, Kairos Power Chief Executive. I'm going to reach out to him and see if I can get him on the... In fact, I already have. I'll have to reach out again. So... That's pretty darn cool. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be very interesting. And they specifically mentioned um, our favorite Miss America, Grace Stanky. Um, oh, yeah, article, she's right so down we in the article, sure we too. Little, we got to give a little. We, we, we've had her on the podcast multiple times. Um, I mean, this is good, you know, because talking about the cheapest and most efficient form of energy, that really is nuclear. You know, guys like Doug oh, Sandridge is. have accurately laid out why if we could do this properly, nuclear is the best move. The problem is you've got these regulatory commissions, you know, legislation through regulation. It's making, Ugh. it's becoming it so hard to permit these that we, we get all excited when just a new construction permit is there. It's a test reactor. As much as I'd love to jump up and down, What's that going to do? It's a test reactor. You're still five to 10 years away. Uh, and then you got to get another permit to build the actual one. Right. So, so we need to, you know, once I hear about nuclear regulation reform, then I'll get excited. A shocking development. Biden plans to roll out back rule design to juice EV push on the country. And our picture of... I'm going to just leave that alone, but he's hanging out of his head and he can't even drive. The Biden administration is planning to slow down the rollout of a rule that was designed to juice the United States transition to electric vehicles. Michael, this is uh, very much. Do you remember um, the prime minister of the UK took a beating because he did the same thing? The EPA just rolled this out. The new car la rule last year would require nearly 70% of new car and truck sales to have no tailpipe emissions yeah. by 30, uh, 2032. Mm -hmm. The critics claim the sudden shift would devastated the U.S. auto industry. So they're going to give them a reprieve by a couple years, um, Michael. And I think that this is going to be a little bit of a black eye. We know that they're uh, pandering to the climate activists, and this is going to be a, a big problem. They can say, oh, we're not quitting, but we are pushing it out because of the EV failures. Yeah, well, it's it's funny how they wait a year too long to roll out with stuff it's it's sometimes like a little too little too late unfortunately because you've still got california going full stream steam ahead with their oh. with their plans which yes as on a countrywide it doesn't matter but you still have the individual states which we're all in, in favor of state power here 
There are 17 states that have added legislation, Michael, that says anything California does, they can be as stupid. Mm -hmm. So, so goes California. So goes 17 stupid states. So let's go to the next. But you have to remember, this was just a leak of a potential announcement. They haven't said anything yet. Oh, they're they're, they. This was a flag to throw out there to see how bad it got. And I guarantee you they're going to have to because the unions, uh, the one union boss that is out there is costing a lot of jobs out there. And he's got to do something to appease them and realize that why Toyota may have the best strategy in the EV race. You and I have been on this for quite a while, and that is why are we not putting EVs? I mean, uh, secondary and I, again, I love Elon. I love what Elon's doing. And why don't we just go to the Toyota hybrid model? Uh, let's go through some of the numbers in here. Uh, the four quarters Tesla's generated total revenue and earnings of 96 billion and 15 billion, uh, for, uh respectively for toyota uh toyota's revenue roughly three times larger oh excuse me at 299 billion and 44 billion uh of profits uh but yet tesla's market cap is more than double that of toyota and that's because of the carbon credits and and everything else in there Mm -hmm. so it's it's extremely fascinating why Tesla trades at such a multiple relative to the other car makers. You know, one would say, I I would say it's a lot to do with, they were a tech company masquerading as a, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to brand themselves as a tech company when they're really a car company. The problem is they really are a tech company with autopilot and a lot of the stuff they're doing on the software space. I, I don't have a problem with valuing Tesla higher than I do other automakers, because if they figure out autopilot, and are able to license that software to other companies, they will far and away become larger than the physical automakers. Now, they also come out with really cool cars. It is interesting. The mo- And this is where comparing comps becomes a tricky issue. We saw right. this in, in, uh, in, in a soon-to-be-released um, deal spotlight with John Farrell. We, 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 we highlighted the difference of the multiples between Pioneer, what Pioneer got and, uh, f- from uh being bought by Exxon and what um, Diamondback paid for Endeavor, but it's hard to compare them because there's so much extraneous stuff around it that multiples don't necessarily make sense. Being able to pick comparable companies to say this is a comparable transaction, therefore this is how much I should be valued is tricky. Should you look at Toyota like Tesla? No, in fact, they're two different businesses that may not have any relation with each other except for the fact that they build cars. Uh, here's uh, two big things, uh, takeaways out of this article, Michael. EV drawbacks. Um, Kelly Blue Book uh, claims the five year cost to own an EV versus uh, ICE vehicles is 15% higher. I disagree because I think it's the insurance is just now starting to go through the roof on this. Uh, you take EVs lose an average of 43,515 in value. Ice uh, internal combustion engines depreciate uh, by twenty seven thousand eight hundred and eighty three. So then you have the batteries are less efficient and and those kind of things. But um, the the obvious benefit is fuel costs. The the EV owners will save approximately five thousand in gas. But that's going to be made up in insurance very easily in a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, part of why, you know, Tesla, you know, I, I, if we can scroll down here in the, the fundamentals chart, um, we can throw up here, Miss Producer, you'll see on you'll see really key into that growth area. You talk about revenue growth one year, Tesla at 18, Toyota at 10. Revenue oh, yeah, growth there it over is. five years, 33 percent relative to only 1.1 for Toyota. So where Toyota where Toyota is eating it really is the fact that they over a 5 year span they have not necessarily grown revenue and and 1.1 percentage points is a rounding error. So from a 
percent of how much they're growing, the growth theoretically is probably being looked at by Toyota as cap. Now, the problem is if they do, if hybrids do become the thing of the future, they're poised to be on top of that. So this is also we're coming down to where do you think the market is going and applying that future market to the current fundamentals of either of these companies. And that'll give you a pathway to uh, valuation. Let me throw this at you just a little bit. And that is Ford. Ford is having to, <laughs> uh, Ford is having to retool. You're having the unions. They're shutting down their plants. Let's take, uh, uh, the deindustrialization of Germany, all of the EV plants are backing off and closing down. You have your parts and then the other stories are coming in about the mining and everything else. Toyota is not having any of those expenses so that you take a rat, take a look at in the next two years, Toyota is going to springboard. Boink. It's going to go right on through the roof. We'll, we'll so, see. You heard it here second, Michael. Let's go ahead and dive right in, though. Two wind farms receive over $100 million to turn off. This is, again, as I mentioned, this is an opinion piece from Andrew Montford. We've, we've, we've segmented him on the show today. Um, you know, and he says, regular readers uh, will know that I've long been concerned over the extraordinary levels of payments that force wind farms to switch off. These are so-called constraint payments and are deemed necessary when the wires in the transmission grid have inadequate capacity to get a generator's power to market. He goes on to talk about this idea that, and not this idea, what happens is, is when there's not enough grid capacity to hold the electricity that's coming from the wind farms, it's not that the wind farms are turned off. It's that they are paid to get turned off and a gas fired power station is paid to get turned on. That's closer so that the end user of the electricity is not, as he said, left short. Um, and he has a chart here. I don't know, Miss Producer, if you don't mind pulling this chart up. Total constraint payments on wind farms have risen in 2023 to $382 million dollars for a volume of about 4.3 terawatt hours, which is roughly four days of electrical demand thrown away entirely. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. If you go talk about the, the, the you know, he then breaks down the 2023 bill. We can pull up that next piece. Um, these are wind farm constraint payments specifically to um, um, the specific segments. You're seeing that the largest one, Moray East, it's $54 million to not be turned online. That constrained, that volume uh, ends up being 590 gigawatts, which is like 20% of its output. I mean, 20% of its output. It's absolutely insane. This is the problem when you don't have the grid ready to, to, to really take advantage of even if renewables was working, and in this case, it's not working, but in this case, it's trying to supply power to the grid. And the unfortunate part is the grid can't handle it. So now not only can the, do we have to just not have the wind farm on and lose whatever potential benefits we might have, we're also now paying them to shut down. It, it comes back to um, we're all for the cheapest amount of energy. And the problem is the way we've designed this whole renewable ship, we haven't necessarily found the cheapest. So great article out there. Last article for today is why California's climate disclosure law should doom green energy. I'll tell you what, this is a quite honestly a despicable uh, law that they are putting in. California uh, is putting in a, uh, this uh, to lower the state's carbon uh, footprint, the legislator passed a law requiring all companies over 1 billion in business within California to publicly disclose by 2026, all their direct greenhouse gas emissions stemming from fuel combustion. They utilize as well as indirect greenhouse gas emissions derived from the electricity heating or cooling they consume holy smokes this is such a cost increase that this is absolutely going to be miserable for companies they're going to pass this on to the consumers or they're not going to do business in california and california stands to lose 
major products. You won't be able to buy a lot of products in California. Let me uh, also go here. Since zero emission vehicles can be sold in California uh, after 2035, the state must have 100% clean energy by 2045. That's not going to happen. I, I hate to warn anybody, but you only have 10% at Diablo Canyon by 2045, and Diablo Canyon is going to be past its second uh, extension. So you have 10% right off the top. Then you have wind and solar are not capable of keeping the grid alive. You have all the refined products uh, being that are, in my opinion, going to be bought from China. China uh, has, in my opinion, cut deals, and uh, they are going to uh, buy refined products from China as opposed to making it in the U.S. with better ESG and less impact on the environment than buying from China. But they would rather buy from China and have a, um, a feel-good moment rather than understanding that they are hypocritically impacting the environment. So I, for one, would like to have the lowest kilowatt per hour delivered to all people of the planet with the least amount of impact on the environment. And in order to do that, this law does not impact wind or solar but yet they have even worse impact uh, than does oil and gas and natural gas how much natural gas excuse me how much diesel does it take to mine everything for an ev how much um, does it take in order to get the cobalt the carbon everything else um, uh, copper it, none of that is going to be calculated. How much is it going to cost when a wind farm only lasts eight years? And if you're a wind expert and you would like to visit with me on my podcast, please come out. I want to visit with you. I have not found anyone that has refuted those timelines. Wind farms are not fiscally responsible from day one without tax subsidies. They then start failing on an overwhelming uh, note at the eight-year mark. And uh, like the Inflation Reduction Act, David Blackman has brought out the big point that you are now able to get those that extra funding if you update these things at the end of when they're ready to be updated at eight years when the tax subsidies run out. So now the consumer gets to pay for these things twice and it is not doing the environment any good because they are not recyclable. So if we can get wind and solar in a recyclable, technologically friendly way without printing money, I am all in. Please understand I'm energy agnostic, but natural gas, nuclear, uh, you can't make a iPhone out of uh, a windmill. You can't do it. You cannot make an iPhone out of solar. So I want to talk physics fiscal responsibility and humanity in a positive way.